Instagram Encore. So if you want to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about you. Hi, everybody. I'm Flora Lucini. I am the founder, songwriter, and vocalist for Ma'afa, um, an Afro-progressive hardcore band based in New York City, in Brooklyn. Um, I am professionally a session jazz bass player and Berklee College of Music alumna and grew up as a professional musician um, with my parents who are also jazz musicians. And I've always, but I also grew up in the punk scene, which I got into around the age of 13. I started booking shows and joining some punk bands around that era. And it's kind of snowballed into this whole career since then. Um, booking shows back then is kind of the reason why I chose music business as a major at Berkeley. And <laughs> I've been doing it ever since. Um, and then eventually, you know, I've been playing bass for so many bands all my life and gigging as a bass player outside of hardcore and punk that eventually when it was time, um, I moved to New York officially full time. And I was like, dude, I just want to do a band that kind of merges all of my worlds together and all of my talents together as an artist and, uh, business music business person or whatever and so i've been doing that and it's been awesome and i'm very happy and i love living in new york it's where i belong <laughs> so here we are but i'm still a southern girl at heart okay <laughs> still from below the mason dixon technically <laughs> nice nice how did you um get started in music because i mean it's pretty much been your whole life yeah, I started around like the age of three, as most of those kinds of kids are. <laughs> I started singing, playing piano. My mom plays saxophone and my dad plays the bass. And so I grew up with in the industry and just kind of understanding like there's this whole other culture for children of musicians that happens. And then we all kind of connect and grow up together. Um, so I did that and I've been singing my whole life. I've been in chorus and in middle school and high school, I was in um, choral competitions, you know, at state festivals and things like that. And when I was about 11 or 12, that's when I revisited the album Tragic Kingdom <laughs> by No Doubt. And there's a song on there called Different People. And I heard the bass line, I was like 11, no, like 10 or 11. And I was like, I looked over to my dad and I was like, daddy, what is that bass line? What is that? What's going on over here? Well, what, what instrument was I hearing? And he goes, oh, that's the bass. I was like, is that what you play? He was like, yeah. I was like, I'm going to do that. And then the rest <laughs> is history. <laughs> that's how we, so take, thank you to Tony Canal for giving me my start in my career. He doesn't even know me. <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> I love that. That album is so iconic. Like, oh, yeah. Such a gem. Such the a gem. album before it, though, people don't really talk about it. Yeah. Tragic Kingdom was incredible. Her brother, uh, Gwen Stefani's brother, Eric Stefani, is one of my favorite songwriters in history. He's a genius storyteller and songwriter. That's why he ended up writing for The Simpsons eventually, because I think because he's smart, you know? And, but there is an album they had that they put out independently when they were going through label stuff after the whole Trapped in the Box album. Um, they had an album called The Beacon Street Collection that so they put out independently. Yeah. And holy moly, <laughs> Tony Canal kind of just shut the whole game down and changed it for everybody. And then Tragic Kingdom happened and I was like, what did we do to be so worthy of two things in a <laughs> row? Like, do it again. It was incredible. So yeah, that's how I got my start playing bass and when I was 12 my dad was like here's a bass here's an amp have at it and by the time I was 14 I joined my first punk band and I was gigging outside of punk and there was a community space in Maryland uh, where I'm from called The Electric Maid and it was a non-bar all ages like just community living room is what they used to call it and so it was all DIY, DIY ran by like former hippies and old OG like DC hardcore kids from the early 80s and Riot Girls. So we kind of all got together and they were going to shut down because nobody was available for booking. There wasn't anything happening. And I was like, I'll do it. <laughs> and here we are. <laughs> How did you end up gravitating towards hardcore? 
because I like violence. No, I'm joking. <laughs> I mean, am I though? Am I joking? I don't know. I'm still working on it. Even in my 30s, I'm kind of unpacking, as the kids say. So, well, I have. All, I think I've always like gravitated towards more aggressive music, more especially like other non cishet male genders, like being at the forefront of presenting that aggression and making that aggression like valid and seen and you know what I mean for little girls like myself and other folks so growing up all the music around me has been jazz bossa nova latin jazz world music things like that nothing really hit until like hole and grunge and all that stuff in the early 90s came out and I was like ooh 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 <laughs> but that led me into punk and then punk still wasn't hard enough. It wasn't like, ugh, you know, I don't know how to explain it, but like, ugh, is the closest? Yeah. <laughs> Correct. And I still didn't feel like it was all the way representative of whatever it was that I was feeling in my 13 year old spirit. And then um, New York hardcore became a thing that people exposed me to in my community and beat down became a thing, but like a different type of what, the kids today are calling beat down. Beat down, like scheduled beating and everybody gets hurt, irate and things like more metal-y stuff in the 90s. And I heard all these Castle Heights bands at the time and all this New York hardcore. And I was like, yup, sign me up. I was like, did that person just do a flying monkey onto the other guy's head and spin kick his best friend into the floor and everyone hugged? <laughs> Where they do that at? I want to be there. <laughs> like, I want to go. Oh my God, it sounds like so much fun. And so, so I did. I went to Sidebar Tavern for a show. I got, I was like 13. I got knocked out. My uh, my homegirl got punched in the eye. And uh, I was like, yeah, that that tracks. And I want to do that forever. <laughs> so it's like the perfect example of like the hardcore scene. Like when you have to describe it to someone who just hasn't been in that environment, like, the only time I've ever gotten hurt has been at hardcore shows. Like I've gotten black eyes like kicked in the face, you know? <laughs> oh yeah, I've done it by accident. They're like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. <laughs> They're like, what are you apologizing for? And I'm like, you're right, <laughs> it's my bad. <laughs> it's horrible. <laughs> And I love it. I love like being afraid for my life while watching music. That's a really good feeling. It's an adrenaline rush. But yeah, sometimes I'll go see beatdown bands at like, um, like I saw one, saw a couple shows at Brooklyn Bazaar a couple years ago where I had to literally stand on the couch by the entrance of the venue mm -hmm. upstairs just to watch to see what's happening. And it was like a wave. It's like when you go to the ocean and you're afraid of the waves, but it's fun and you're jumping. <laughs> <laughs> that's what happened to you're me. You're kind of afraid for your life, but you're still enjoying yourself. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That's exactly right. That's exactly what happened. So it's, all, it's so funny, like, the OG bros in hardcore are always telling me, like, no, nah, you kids don't understand anything, you know? And you're like, okay, Doomer. And <laughs> they're like, and they're like, back in the day, I used to be scared to go to the LES. And I was like, yeah, because, like, woo, <laughs> let's talk about why that is, though. <laughs> that's a different kind of fear. Oh, absolutely. I, that's, mm -mm. it's funny hearing that, because, like, my mom grew up in the punk scene, too. Like, she yeah. was there, like, when it started and she was involved in like the LA scene so like it's fun listening to her talk about like the stories from back then but then there is also that like you guys just don't understand like how it was back then and I'm like well no we still have like those same issues and like those situations you know it's just it's different yeah. now you know like yeah we're still it's interesting stuff. <laughs> I mean I mean it is different I was very lucky I'm in my 30s and I was very lucky to have come into the scene so young so I got to catch the end of the 90s scene and how it and witness it transition into the early 2000s and like the uh, takeover of metalcore and like revival of new age emo and all those things that happened in 2000s and where we are today. And I, I do agree that there is a huge difference between everything back then versus our generations now. Um, one of the things is Gigi Allen can never happen today. <laughs> Let's start there. 
And if he did happen today and you find yourself uh, aligning with his music, something doesn't sound correct. <laughs> I can't imagine like the thought of him like wandering around a show today, like no. I, it just, it get, just first of all, <laughs> first of all, I'd be the first one jumping at the opportunity to drag him on Black Twitter. I just want to <laughs> say, I'd be the first one. <laughs> oh my gosh! Yeah, that that would be insane. Like, yeah. So, great. but that's the thing. I mean, it is a difference in culture, and the difference is the shit that y'all tolerated and normalized and back in the day because you didn't have access, tools, resource, education, vocabulary, praxis, community organizing, any of that shit going down. Let's call it what it is. Y'all yeah. had all that going on, which made for great music. Sure, I'll give you that, but also made for the highest statistics of women and non binary folks before we had that vocabulary being raped and murdered and beat down. Oh, yeah. as shows all through the 90s and 80s it gave way for rampant transphobia it gave way for uh racism uh anti-blackness all that shit and it's extremely ignorant and just extremely mi misinformed on literally almost everything and so the difference between their generation and ours is that we're not going to take that bullshit and we're going to correct ourselves hold each other accountable and actually do better absolutely the difference absolutely. We, um, we've had that conversation before. We talked to um, Alice Bag, who, I mean, she was... <laughs> she's I was gonna ask you, because you said you're from, your mommy was in the LA scene back then. I was like, does she know her? Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> so excited. Yeah, I mean, we've gone to acoustic shows and she's just showed up and, I mean, came in. I, that acoustic, there was an acoustic show our friend played and Alice Bag showed up and Kanan like ran out of it. She was like, oh my God, Alice Bag is here. Like Alice Bag is here. <laughs> That's us. I'd have been there like, oh my God, I know. Oh my God, I know. What do we do? Like, what do we do? <laughs> <laughs> it's approaching us. Oh my God. <laughs> um, we've been fortunate to, you know, talk to her for this platform. And one of the things that she talked about was mm -hmm. the fact that marginalized people and you know people of color you know lgbtq all these people have essentially been erased from the narrative that was punk in the 70s and 80s when it was a little more prevalent than what people think you know she's queer and you know this chicana lady who was a big part of the formation of the la punk scene oh huge. and was treated as kind of an afterthought when you look at the 70s scene you automatically think like it was cis white male and that was it yeah when it really wasn't that there it was much more I mean, colorful than people are led to believe of course absolutely i mean rock and roll in itself and you know i talk about uh, i talk a lot about this in almost every interview i do because it needs to be re-educated on a global level honestly but um everybody's perception of punk and hardcore for the longest, calculate how long I've been alive and add 20 years, you know, has always been, it's cisgendered, it's heterosexual, it's white, it's male, that's it, you know? And not just any kind of cis, cis het, you know, white male, it's a specific kind of <laughs> fit into the box. Because then you have little white boys that are coming up that are struggling with their sexual identity, their gender identity, with their jockey bro-ness, not really wanting to align to that. And they get marginalized out of, and I use that term loosely with them, right out of punk and hardcore, you know? So I get it and I live it. And I've actually experienced that when there have been white people in the DC hardcore scene that come in 10, 12 years after I've already been around, I've already been contributing, booking shows, building up bands, being in many bands, and they'll write a book or they'll do a photo exhibition or whatever with pictures from shows that I've booked, from shows with bands that I've been in, uh, you know, talking about stories that could only have happened if I booked it, you know, whatever. And I'm completely left out of the narrative. Yeah. So that is a very common theme. And I think what Ma'afa and Rebelmatic and the 1865 and all these other black, I call it the black punk renaissance. That's what I call what's happening right now. And I think what we're all trying to do is kind of reclaim that narrative mm -hmm. and recontest what my whole point, and this is, Spoiler alert, what I want to do for grad school, write my book, is to recontextualize the Black experience in punk and, you know, alternative subcultures in general. 
because we have to tell our own stories. So that's why connecting with other femmes and other people and everyone else that's also marginalized in these communities like y'all, we can, if we don't give each other these platforms, then they tell our stories. Mm -hmm. They don't tell their right because they wasn't really there. Mm -hmm. And then you were erasured out of everything, you know? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. We were just talking about um, the Sister Girl Riot. I was like, and I, I saw it like, cause we, we didn't know about that. And someone just happened to ask like on their Instagram story, Hey, does anyone know about this movement? And I was like, what is this? Like I looked it up and I was like, holy shit. Like this was, we've never like learned about this and we've never heard of it because it has been a race. Like we were like foaming at the mouth. Cause we we're like, oh my God, this is like a whole thing. Like yes. just blown away by it. It's incredible because I was, Honey Child and I try to remember if I was in high school or if I, I dropped out of high school at 16 and went straight to college. Mm -hmm. I got into a special program scholarship thing because I was like, high school, I'm over it. I want to go to college. And Maryland was like, okay, <laughs> <laughs> that's cool. And so I was either in high school or college. And I remember, I think it was like 2005 and Sister Girl Rise was a thing. And like all these folks that I'm friends with now and in bands with now in New York, now in my thirties were people I never knew growing up and like grew up idolizing. <laughs> like the other black person at the punk show, <laughs> Maki Dada, you know what I mean? Like, let's be friends. Oh. And I was so happy <laughs> when Sister Girl Riots came out because first of all, who is not obsessed with Tamar Kali? Like, yes, give me all my life. Nice. And who is not obsessed with Honey Child Coleman? You know what I mean? So for then years later to be introduced to them finally in person and be able to work with them in music and learn more about Sister Girl Rides because I ended up meeting everybody from Sister Girl Rides. I'm friends with Maya. Simi has worked with 1865. She and I are close. Like she's going to be on one of my projects next year. Like that was important. That was a big thing. That was the predecessor, in my humble opinion, to what we now have Afropunk. Yeah. You know, like the the two, that story needs to be told if you're going to tell the Afropunk story, the real Afropunk yeah. story. Shout out to James Spooner, the homie. But like, you got to talk about Sister Girl Rides. You got to talk about those shows and CBs and what Black people were doing and organizing at the time before we can even get to why James took a camera mm -hmm. to everybody's face to be like, we matter. You know what I mean? <laughs> like and how we got here today, you know? There's so many different things that have happened throughout like punk history, you know, that people just yeah. aren't aware of. Yeah, absolutely. And it's not just, oh, I think I lost you, hon. Okay, and it's not just, you know, it's everybody's story. Black history is everybody's history. Yeah. You know what I mean? And to some extent, and I use that phrasing very loosely, but if you want to know the history of America, if you want to know the history of music, if you want to know how we got R&B, pop, jazz, funk, rock and roll, soul, anything, you got to talk to black folks <laughs> in the United States, African Americans, you know what I mean? Black Americans, you know, specifically, because within the black community, there's also globally, there's also a lot of anti-blackness towards African American folks, black American folks. And that's something that people don't talk about, but everybody benefits from the praxis around social justice and inequality that they've created, uh, the music, culture, and food that they've created, the vocabulary, the AAVE and language, the styles, the trends, that becomes a global way and identifier of blackness all over the world. But then many black immigrants shit on black Americans, to be frank, and not sugarcoat it because we don't got the time. You know what I mean? So there's just a lot that needs to be spoken about and we need to give credit where credit is, where credit is due, you know? And I think um, I always circle back to the bad brains, of mm -hmm. course, um, who to me are the inventors and godfathers of hardcore and who kind of changed the entire game because they brought groove, song structure, musicianship, actual instrument instrumentalization. <laughs> I went to college <laughs> and all this other stuff, you know, it's just like, we need to give credit where credit is due. And the way that in hardcore, the white supremacy aspect of hardcore in a lot of our communities, especially like what I've experienced in New York is completely out of control. 
it's completely out of control. It's just like, what are you doing? And there's a huge divide in generation. There's a huge divide in race um, to a point where I have a lot of friends who are OG hardcore kids from back in the day kind of guys, New York hardcore and girls. And they are very much like, you know, yo, Flo, let me get a vocalist for this project I'm doing, but from your scene though. I'm like, my scene, didn't we just play with Death Before Dishonor? Didn't we just, when one we at the same show, I thought I saw you there. Like, <laughs> what are you talking, my scene? We go to the same shows, what do you mean? Oh my gosh, it drives me nuts. But that's a subconscious like Freudian slip of like, I'm othering you out of something that wasn't even mine to control to begin with. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And I mean, that brings up like an interesting point too, because like we've talked about it, especially like, um, like during Black History Month, you know, people want to amplify these black voices and you right. know showcase and highlight. But we also need to remember that it goes beyond just Black History Month. You know, like you can't just segregate them and designate. Okay, we're just gonna talk about them in February, and that's it. Exactly. Just, just that month. That's it. And no that's it. Right. Shortest month of the year. You got it, dude. <laughs> <laughs> that's all you got. Two extra days. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that's too much. That's too much. It's leap year. Okay, let's leap. Leap on over that girl. Leap on over it. Yeah, I'm just like, it's, it's a lot going on around all of that, especially around the performativeness, like yes. all of the organizing I've done, especially post George Floyd, Ahmaud Aubrey, Breonna Taylor, you see every year, every couple of months, when one of us is murdered and assassinated, um, you see an uprising of resistance in a lot of communities, especially the QTPOC punk community. But you also see sometimes even more so an uprising in performativeness, you know, and the performativeness of wanting to... My, okay, my guitar player in my alpha, shout out to Anthony Solis, my best friend ever, <laughs> my BFF. He made this really great analogy after George Floyd when I was completely burnt out. And he said, when everyone was putting up Black Lives Matter signs in our, you know, $8.50 latte coffee shops in Brooklyn that are completely white, ran and owned, um, he was like, it's kind of like the lamb's blood over the door. You know, of like, spare our house. We're in alignment with you, spare our house. We're not actually gonna do any work. We're not actually going to hold ourselves accountable or our own people accountable. We don't actually know what the hell we're talking about. <laughs> but if BLM says it's okay, it's okay. <laughs> you know what I mean? They'll say like, Black Lives Matter and say like, oh, I'm, I'm here and I'm an ally. But then it's like, if you're in your friend group and they make like a racist joke, are you gonna say something to right. them? Like, right, you know, like, no, please don't come over asking me to braid your hair and asking me for a skincare product uh, that are black owned. And then when your boyfriend makes a horribly racist comment or misogynistic or transphobic or whatever, and you just go, ha ha ha, that's so funny. And then do nothing. Like, yeah, give me back all that shea moisture and get out of my face. I'm like, no. Forget all of it, just give me back all my <laughs> Exactly, I was like, you don't even have edges, goodbye. <laughs> like, no. What is this? Oh man, yeah, yeah, but it's kind of a segue. Now we'll now we'll talk about Mafa and how that got started. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so Mafa, like I said earlier, was just uh, this idea I've had. I was in this other band in DC called Curbside Revenge, um, and I think I started that band maybe at like seventeen. I think I was like seventeen. And up until then, I had been playing bass for everyone's bands, majority white. And mo there were a lot of POC in most of the bands I grew up in. I didn't even realize that until I got older because it was very white. But, then, <laughs> you know, very white. And so, <laughs> and so um, that was interesting. And then I was, and then, okay, so then James came out with Afropunk. Then I watched it and then I cried. And then I was like, one day I will go to my tribe, I will find my village in New York. And the next day after watching Afropunk, I called 
the other five black people that went to hardcore shows with me at the time that played instruments. And I was like, I don't care what you're doing. You're going to do this now. And they were like, okay. And so we started a band called Curbside Revenge and it was hilarious and awesome. And we were kids learning, learning what we could. Eventually the band broke up. I went away to college and once a year we'd get back together for my birthday. And that's when I started after I went to Berkeley, started incorporating percussion into the band because my whole entire vision of hardcore and punk had completely changed once I left DC, mm -hmm. like officially. And I started to go to shows in New York and I started to meet other people just like me everywhere that was like, yeah, dude, I go from listening to Fela Kuti to listening to Warzone in like 20 seconds. And I'm like, oh, I am not alone. Like, you know, because DC is very, everyone sticks to their genre and everyone sticks to their click. And I, if I'm a skinhead and I listen to oi, that's all I listen to, you know what I mean? And so like, there's a couple of other genres that are okay. And so that never fit me and DC never made sense for me. So I bounced and Berkeley happened. Percussion and curbside revenge happened. Curbside finally broke up. I moved on with my life and I decided if you, you got to create what you wish existed. That is the point of Maafa is to create what you wish existed in so many different ways, not just musically, but like when we play shows to make sure that I announce before any show that like everyone who's not a cis hat white dude, like this is your time. You get out of five bands, this is your time for half an hour, let them live, let them make it safe in and out. Can they have this moment, please? Can y'all relax? You know, society got you, you be all right, you know what I mean? And so um, Maafa was just about that and about the music that I wanted to collide all these worlds. I wanted to bring jazz and session work and how we do it in the jazz world where I don't have band practice <laughs> in jazz world. I get a call for a gig. I better know the music with the charts or that get sent charts or I learn it on the gig when I get there and we sub out people. So I'm bringing all these cultural things from that community into punk and hardcore because I think people need to learn that it's okay to not have to rehearse with the same people every single week and do a band. That's cool, but there's other ways to get shit done in 2021 that's not necessarily that. Yeah. And so, and this opens up the ability to have five different bass players and three different drummers outside of our original lineup. You know, I get to play with all these great musicians. And um, so then that's what happened with Moth. I decided to write my own music from my own band do my own arrangements of, of originally Maafa had two bass players, had an entire percussion ensemble on paper, and we're working towards getting that, you know? And it's just been snowballing ever since. Like every time Jeremiah plays bass with us, it's different than when Jabril plays bass with us or when Kai plays bass with us. They all bring a different flavor and approach to the music. So Maafa is trying to like expand the definition of hardcore back also kind of reclaim it back to what it really was about and also kind of how do I say it uh not just expanding the definition but kind of like opening up the possibility of what the sound could be yeah. expanding the sounds definition as well maybe and being able to reclaim a lot of those narratives in our music, being able to kind of redefine certain things that do need to be redefined yeah. in the future and making it more normalized to center us. It's not exclusively black, but it's centering of blackness. Absolutely. It's prioritizing black bodies, black lives, black experiences, specifically black and queer and trans in our community. And that's something that can be relatable to many people, you know, so that's what we're trying to do. <laughs> I think, yeah, when looking at Mafa and like the like 1865, like it's almost like a like a mini movement in itself. Like it's much mm -hmm. more than just a band. Like there's all these mm -hmm. other different things happening within it. Yes, absolutely. And like I said, I call it the Black Punk Renaissance. Yeah. It was totally organic, as me and Creature from Rebelmatic like to say. It started with a show at the silent bar. I mean, it started with all of us working our asses off for the past 30 some years, <laughs> but then it kind of all came together. A couple years ago, I did a show for Divide and Dissolve from the UK or Australia, they're from Australia, excuse me. And we did a silent barn, which is no longer around in Bushwick. 
and great venue. And before I knew it, by the time I was done booking the show, every band was all black. Every band's lead singer besides Rebel Matic were all femmes. And I was like, okay, let's go with that print, <laughs> send out, you know? And it was a Monday night and it was packed. It was raining on a Monday in Bushwick in the middle of February and it was packed and it was beautiful. And a lot of the people from Black Rock Coalition were there. A lot of our good friends from all these great bands were there. Puerto Rican Mike from District 9 showed up. It was a great time. And Creature and I looked at each other after that and we were like, hold up, we on to something. I don't know what it is, but it's nice. We need to we need to keep going. So then we were like, just out of necessity, we started giving each other shows. Rebel Matic got a show, Moffa was on a Moffa got a show, Rebel Matic was on it. It just blah, 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 blah. Eventually, we have the same drummer, Ramsey Jones, the one and only. And, and then 1865 came around in 2017, 18, a little while after that. Actually, 1865 played that show at Silent Barn that I booked where this whole tribe black renaissance thing was happening, started. And there was no bass player in the band. It was just Chuck Trees, Sasha Jenkins, and Honey Child. And that was the night in the backyard of Silent Barn that I was like, well, if you ever need a bass player, could I please? And a month or two later, she calls me and she was like, hey, we're playing Black and Blue Bowl, can you make it? And I was like, yup. <laughs> <laughs> and so now, you know, Biz, who's the drummer for the 1865, is also Jembe in Mafa. I'm in 1865, Ramsey place for everybody, you know? So it's just, <laughs> and it definitely is a movement of several generations. We've got people in their fifties, in their forties, their thirties and twenties coming together with all these different perspectives of what it means to be black or BIPOC in punk and hardcore in New York city, in the, the 2020s, everyone's having this major dialogue about where do we go from here? And how do we like get control back on who decides where we go from here? So Creature one time said this in a conversation that we used to have all the time about this. And he said, you can't define us if you ain't us. And I was like, okay, yes. And that's pretty much the motivation behind what we're doing now is just, okay, this person with green hair who likes goth clothing, um, who's black, is 22, who's never been to a hardcore show, doesn't really know what that is, listens to My Chemical Romance and Paramore, that's the extent of their rock, whatever, but they love going to see Rebelmatic. They love going to see Maafa, whatever. And it got to a point where what solidified the movement for us, as most scenes are solidified, is through a venue. You know, like there's the Castle Heights scene, there's the Coney Island scene, there's the Bond Street cafe scene, there's a CB scene, whatever. Um, for us, it was Max Fish in the Lower East Side, and it was because they gave us our first ever residency. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I've never heard of punk bands, especially all black punk bands doing a monthly artist in residency at a venue in the city. I ain't never heard of it, you know? <laughs> so we did that for two years before COVID. COVID is the reason why we stopped doing it because COVID shut it down. They're no longer around. If it wasn't for COVID, we would have gone into our third year of the residency. And it's MAFA 1865 and Rebelmatic every month, the second Thursday of every month. And we invite another BIPOC band to come play every month. And it was dope. And that's kind of like where everybody, there's people there like, yo, I fucks with your music heavy, dog. But like, you know, I don't listen to that crazy rock shit, but I fucks with y'all heavy. Yo, my alpha, though, <laughs> mighty, mighty, my alpha. And I'm like, yes, yes. <laughs> and I think that's expanding all of it, you know? So yeah, it is a movement. And it's a movement that was created unintentionally, but not without purpose. Mm -hmm. That was created divinely, in my opinion, that was created... Um, organically and that has completely like that has completely taken a life of its own that's bigger than all of us and it's teaching us what we have to do next you know the community speaks to us and tells us as the griots and jellies of this particular renaissance what they need and what they want to say and what the history is that we got to jot down in our music you know yeah and so that's the that's how we 
recontextualize the Africanness of what we do, the blackness of what we do, the narrative of what we do, and everything we do is is in alignment with that. You know, how many times do you go to a hardcore show and everybody that you're at the hardcore show with has a group chat just to make sure everyone got in the house okay? Or how many times do you hear you're born to lose? Is that rockabilly song or a punk song? We have we're born to win. How many times do we say I love you to life? I don't love you to death. What is that? I don't want to die. My life matters. Isn't that the whole damn point? We shut down Union Square. I want to <laughs> live. Fuck you mean? I'm sorry. Y'all bugging. I don't know nothing by no death. Who death? Not me, Jesus. Not me. <laughs> like, I want to make it home to my mama. I want to eat all the food tomorrow. I want to watch Gilmore Girls. Yes, Gilmore Girls. <laughs> I don't want to die. I don't want to listen to that shit. What you mean? No offense to the bands who have made a career around normalizing those types of thoughts. I am here for it, but I want to hear music that uplifts me. I'm black uh, with a with a cup at the end and a capital B. You know, I'm a black. Uh, I don't want to hear music that is talking about foot politics. I'm apolitical. I don't have that privilege. What you mean? No. Yeah. You know, and I want to live. I want to live a life. I have a high quality of life. I want to be healthy. I want to be happy. I want to stick around and see my babies grow up. I want to, you know what I mean? Like, what? Come on, man. I'm over that. But over there. <laughs> Down with yeah, it. Definitely. Yeah, I think uh, one thing that you pointed out, which I do think is unique for Mafa and all of these other bands that are now, you know, coming out of this mini movement is that you do bring the African sound to mm -hmm. punk. I mean, Moffat mm -hmm. describes themselves as Afro progressive hardcore. Mm -hmm. That in itself is like its own genre. You're creating this new Correct. genre of music for people to listen <laughs> to and potentially identify with. Thank you for that. Yes, that wasn't even intentional. You know, you know what's funny about that? First of all, thank you. But you know what's really funny about that is Afro progressive hardcore was just something I came up with because I was like, I was like, oh, my alpha, that's it. I'm done. Yes. And then my mama was like, mm, I don't know. And I was like, you know what? You're right. Because <laughs> the moment we come out, the white people in the scene are going to try to define us for us yeah. with their own revisionist history version of how to define us. And I'm going to have to tell you what it is because I can't trust you to come up with the proper conclusion on your own yeah. historically. You're gonna do that. So I was like, okay, so what we're gonna do is I'm gonna tell you what it is I'm trying to present, how you take it, how you define it for yourself, how you experience it. That's all you, baby. But what you will not do is misidentify what it is we really about. Because I want to be very clear, and everything I do has to be clear because they love to say they misunderstood you before they kill you. They love to gaslight you into thinking that it's all in your head. You know what I mean? So what you're not going to do is that. Yes, Ken is like, yes, I've been there. I relate. Yes. You know, because y'all know how it is. Y'all know how they are. We're women. We know how it goes. So I decided to call it Afro Progressive Hardcore. And I was like, I will let y'all know. And even with, with that title, we played a show, I forgot where, who they're gonna be mad because they know I'm talking about them. But somebody I know, whose name I'm not gonna say out loud because I'm respectful. <laughs> but we was at a show one time and they were very sweet and cute. And they were trying to express to their friend their joy about my offer. They're like, oh my gosh, she just started to sleep in. They're so cool. Blah, blah. And, she, and they said, Ooh. they said, um, my alpha is a reggae band with bongos and there's like a reggae hardcore band with bongos. I said, the devil is a liar and he's lying through your face. I said, what? <laughs> Bitch, where? <laughs> and then I had to remember it because I was like, reggae? I was like, oh yeah, there's one breakdown section in one song out of eight that has a reggae break. <laughs> I was like, no, 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 we're not doing that. I turned over to th this person and I grabbed them by their arm and I said, huh, what was it? I don't, I don't know who this band is, but it's that mob. And so that's why we call ourselves that. Our progressive hardcore. <laughs> oh my gosh, reggae. Well, I think like, yeah. I mean, oh my I gosh, reggae. <laughs> I'm happy you have this 
you know, thing to call yourselves because I think what tends to happen is people pick up on like that one little sound that sounds like something else and they're like, okay, that's what they are. Yeah, exactly. And I know it's going to happen and it's fine. And in five years from now, as Creature already prepped me for, there's going to be an all white boy band coming out of New York or somewhere in Idaho with dreadlocks in their hair and uh, radushka beads around their neck talking about their Afro progressive hardcore. I know what's going to happen. I know 311 going to come at my throat. I know. I know. <laughs> and that's fine. If you say it to my PayPal, I'll be all right. <laughs> I had to say it. So, but it's, it's important to understand as an artist that you can't control anything once you put it out there. And that's something we all have to just make peace with. But it's also important for Black folks, especially um, in anything they do, that we have to be very vigilant about taking control and keeping control over our narratives and over our own stories and identifying and self-determining who we are first so that when they do start getting confused <laughs> all along their own lonesome, you know, we can be like, like, no, this is not black and white. There's no gray. This is very black and white and this is what it is, you know? And sometimes you have to be like that. And also I just think it's a dope title and it'll be dope to start another genre because why the fuck not? Like, yes. <laughs> yeah. I, I want to see sick of it all with a bunch of djembes on stage one day i want to see it i'd be like told you told you you're gonna see you. another band you know who would be great at that is snap case yeah mm -hmm. like snap case is a huge influence on me and the music i write for my alpha because i'm like that is not i'm listening to the drummer for snap case and i'm like child boo that is not just no you know, punk rock, whatever. I'm like, you're doing things. You're doing very sophisticated musical things. You're doing very African things. You're doing very six, eight polyrhythmic things. I'm like, I like this. And so one of the things that was the greatest inspiration for Maafa, because you asked earlier, um, is that my whole life I've heard hardcore differently than most of the people I grew, grew up around. Um, I, I can hear hardcore and I can hear bands like Snapcase, like even Irate and whatever. And I can, it's almost like if I have to explain it, it's almost like I can visualize all the sounds individually as like little puzzle pieces and I can like separate them apart and take out the puzzle piece that I'm like, oh, that rhythm that that guy is playing in that band is actually from the Mali empire. And it comes from this rhythm of a dun dun or whatever. And if they had a percussionist to accent those little parts, it would sound even better, you know? And then I was like, why hasn't anybody thought of this? And I was like, oh, maybe it's because I'm thinking of it. Oh, maybe <laughs> I should just do it. And so I've listened to hardcore like that. I've listened to all music like that my whole life, but especially hardcore. I can hear shit in the percussion, in the rhythms mm -hmm. that everyone's like, ha, huh? what now? And then we do, and then they're like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> So that's my offer for you. <laughs> nice. Yeah. yeah. Sweet. Um, let's talk a little bit about like your activism. And your Gosh, that's been such a lingering word over my head my whole life. <laughs> I grew up with a lot of identity crises and it's been very hard to find my place or where I belong and not ever having a community that told me it's okay to belong to more than one thing at a time <laughs> because we live in a binary world. <laughs> You like how I work that in? Okay. <laughs> you know, on all fronts, not just gender, but if you're of this gender, of this race, of this height, of this body shape, of whatever, you have to fit into this or this, but that's it. You get one or two options. And I'm like, I ain't fit in everywhere. Sorry. And <laughs> so um, I had to go through a lot of things through my teen years. Mm -hmm because I come from a very leftist, very political family and a lot of activism in my family in Brazil during socialism and during, well, not during socialism, but during the attempt at trying to fight for us through socialism and communism. Um, but during the fascism and the military state in Brazil and the dictatorship. Anyway, fast forward to me, I grew up 
having to go through some experiences as a teen in my early 20s of people that did not have to take the time out of their day to correct me, but had the compassion in their heart enough to do so. And also the frustration of like, we're just done with you. You know what I mean? To correct any of my internalized misogyny, any of my internalized or any of my uh, transphobia before we even had this, these, we didn't have social media and we didn't have this vocabulary or this praxis. It was all just like, this is wrong. Let me tell you why you're wrong. And you're like, huh? You know, and a lot of internalized homophobia, a lot of all that and internalized anti-blackness, not even knowing what colorism was until, you know, all that kind of stuff. And if it wasn't for Black women, Black trans women, Black feminists, BIPOC, QT BIPOC, Indigenous folks kicking major ass on taking social media and weaponizing it against oppression and being like, just boom, 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 is what we're going to do, Black Twitter or whatever. Most of us from my generation, you know, would just be completely lost into the abyss of ignorance as I like to call it, you know, that's a good band name or like song right there, the abyss of ignorant, <laughs> you know, you just ignorant. But because of that labor yeah. and because it spoke to my true humanity, instead of trying to too hard to fit into this cis het, white skinhead, problematic bullshit culture, I'm like, oh, this is who I really am. This is how I really feel. This is why I'm seen, yay, you know, whatever. Um, that snowballed into just me being myself. Next thing you know, I'm in college. Next thing you know, I'm hosting walkouts and this and the third and organizing. And then all of a sudden social media blows up with all this social media activism. And I was like, ooh. And I had to unpack so much shit. And I was like, oh, you're right. Cause trauma is real y'all, you know? And then I got into all these Facebook groups and all this stuff. And then it just became second nature to me. And now I just go around being like, that is wrong. That's okay. <laughs> That's wrong. <laughs> you know what I mean? And now I've calmed down a lot and I'm kind of like, everyone just lives how they want to live, but I'm going to live how I want to live. You don't have a right to get upset with me. And then what we're not going to do is allow people to get away with problematic bullshit that we all know is wrong. Yeah. Period. Like there's just no, there's no redemption. There's no, 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 for me, um, certain things, most things, there is just none of that. I'm just over it. That's not my journey. Go by whatever, you know, but my activism has been trying to, I always thought activism had to be this like overt community organizing, taking to the streets. And then I grew up and learned that that's just one of the many effective ways to get the attention of, of our culture and our society. Um, so I aid in that a lot, but most of my activism comes from hands-on in the ground, in the community, trying to organize and bring people together, being like the bridge that, you know, that makes my birthday show is a great example of people that normally would never be caught dead at the same show throughout the year come together for my birthday show and they're like oh you're not so bad I like your band <laughs> and the next thing you know those bands that would never play together are on tour you know and muchacha fanzine out in the muchacha collective out in te Texas San Antonio Texas they recently allowed me to do invited me to do an article for their zine about collective care and mutual aid and I talked about my tribe you know, we call it tribe and all that, you know, all the black kids, black punk renaissance. And that's only something that could have happened in New York for me, you know, in my, in my life, that it was only New York. And, and we talk a lot about how activism, what is activism? What is action, right? Yeah. And we talk a lot about how me showing up to a show with my alpha 1865, whatever. And it's like, we go to Max Fish, we go downstairs, we close the door behind us. And it's like, we're transported into like this punk rock Wakanda and can't nobody fuck with us. And we're in there for a couple hours and nothing has to bother us. It's just us. I mean, it's just blackity, black, 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 black everywhere. And a couple of our friends. And we're just hanging out like the staff members, the bartenders, the booker, the organizer, the bands, the sound person, whatever, everybody black. 
And everybody's a hardcore kid. Everybody's a punk. Everybody's a metalhead. Everyone's into goth. Everyone's into like that weird, obscure emo from 95. You know what I mean? Whatever. And everybody loves Prince. Y'all gonna go ahead with that. I'm sorry. I love you. Cancel me now. Because I can't. And I don't look good in purple. So that's really what I'm mad about. But anyway. Actually, I look cute in purple because I look good in anything. But <laughs> so, that happens. But we were in backstage. And it, I was having this conversation with my kids. And I was just like, yo, like, sitting down and helping the guys in, um, the guys in, uh, uh, Rebelmatic or our kids in, that come and see my AFA feel like they can be seen, they can be heard, they can be validated, they're safe. I think that that to me is incredible and part of the activism that we do. And the other thing is also just utilizing the band and the funds from the band and the, the shows that we're really picky about. Um, to kind of activate this global community of collective care. Cause that's really where my activism lies is in a collective care kind of approach to things. And there, to me, there's nothing more revolutionary than a bunch of black kids coming together that listen to punk rock and making sure everybody eats everybody's birthday is celebrated, everybody makes it home safe, everybody has somebody's network. So like Rachel is in film production and books shows and Cad be reading all the charts and, and doing this and making sure the dogs are walked and the babies are sad and whatever. So, you know what I mean? And everybody does has a skill, has a whatever labor that they bring to the table. And we make sure that our little village is just the ecosystem is just moving. Yeah. and anything happens to one of us, it happens to all of us. Mm -hmm. And we are all equipped to be able to take to proper news outlets, proper community organizing outlets that we need to do to shut something down or to get someone's attention or whatever. And I think that is the major bulk of my activism nowadays. And also just calling out white people and, and men on Facebook for they bullshit because ain't nobody got the time for that. <laughs> Cause I mean, it's a lot. I mean, it's a lot. It is a lot, especially with social media. Like it gets crazy on there. Like, it's exhausting. <laughs> exhausting. I'm like, who let you out the house with those thoughts today? Who was it? Oh, Show God. them to me. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot. I don't engage with the whites and the men anymore like that, unless I absolutely have to. I don't seek it. I don't see a point to it. I have no interest in correcting or whatever, anybody, no more, unless I have to, unless I'm in a situation at work or in school or I'm being paid to do it. Let me rephrase that for every black person, specifically black women and black trans women who have not gotten paid to do the labor that has become the entire structure of how people are contextualizing social injustice resistance right now. It's depleting of my energy, of my sanity, of my mental health and physical health, and defeats the purpose because then you're killing me, which all of that stress will manifest into disease in my body. Then you're killing me anyway, and you're sucking me dry so that you can come up, and the devil is a whole lot. So we're not going to do that no more because it don't make no sense. So what I will do is when my white friends that are trying to unpack what they're going through and all of these new ideas and experiences, they reach out to me and they ask first. They say, hey, Flora, do you have the spoons to deal with my ignorance today? And I'd be like, mm, I don't know, let me think about it. Get more girls, it's on repeat today, I don't know. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, fine, yeah. And so when I say yes, they give me whatever the issue is and then I answer it to my, the best of my ability. And then I remind them we're not a monolith. So my answer will not be everybody's answers and yeah. that's okay, you know? And that's as far as that'll go. However, I will always just overdo it with my labor for women, for black folks, for indigenous folks, for all the marginalized folks out there. I will absolutely go ham, especially for black folks to a point where like my hair could fall out and I'll be like, I don't even need it. Let's go get it, <laughs> you know? <laughs> but nobody else, I'm fine. <laughs> Thank you. <all. laughs> so what's like, if you were to give advice to someone who may not know 
where to start, especially like the cis white people, like, cause we've talked to, we've talked to a number of them who've said, you know, they want to help, they want to do all these things, but they're, they don't know how to do it in a way that might be squashing those voices. So what would be, like, do you have any advice for those people in ways that they can help amplify these? So let me see if I got your question. Well, I think, I think it depends. Like, I, I'm just going to use the context that I'm familiar with, right? Which is usually white and non-Black POC trying to become allies for Black folks during this time because that's what's happening, right? So the first thing I would do as a advice for somebody who is non-Black or white, non-Black POC or white, who's trying to be an ally to Black folks is understand that um, we don't need y'all. We would like to have friends that care about our humanity enough to figure out what can I do in my existence to lessen the blow that you take every day. Mm -hmm. But it's not a necessity because the problem with not making that clear is that people sometimes accidentally go into savior complex mode. And then we have to call out people for being performative. And we need to dial that all the way back. At the end of the day, you're talking about human life. Mm -hmm. If you take away all the other vocabulary, what you're talking about is how are the ways, what in which ways are black people not being treated, seen, or, or approached as human beings, right? The same with queer folks and trans folks and indigenous folks and women folk and whatever. Like, in which ways are you not being treated as a full human being with access to the same rights and the exact privileges and freedoms as a cisgendered heterosexual white male? Like, in which ways is that not happening? And I think the number one thing that I'll ever encourage someone who's non-Black to do that will ever align itself with my definition of ally to Black people is don't talk over us, listen to what we're saying. You don't have the answers. You don't have the capacity or the experience to challenge what we're saying. Listen to it, internalize it, and then go back to your village and correct it. That's it. Yeah. That's all I really need y'all to do. You know what I mean? I don't need y'all to do nothing but that. Correct it. So if you're from Colombia and you're a white Colombian, a white passing, whatever, and you go to Buela's house that weekend and you're wearing your Black Lives Matter and she goes, ay, por qué se morenitos, coño, da, 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 da. whatever. That's very Dominican, but I, I just can't, dish, I can't do it. You know, Colombian insert here, you know, whatever. Um, correcting that, understanding that Hispanic is not a race, Latino is not a race. Me and Cameron Diaz are not the same race of people just because we're both Latinx, you know? So it would be really important for people to go back into their village and correct shit and constantly hold themselves accountable. Don't let us have to do all the work. You need to do the work. So if we're correcting you on this thing, you need to be at a thousand percent, yeah. you know? And if you're going to keep asking us for labor, you need to pay us for our labor. Figure out a way, barter something, but you can't deplete us and then use everything that we've taught everybody how to do just by our, in our own resilience, it's not even voluntarily teaching anything, but then use that to become trendy and fads and whatever. And while we're still getting killed, TikTok, non-Black people on TikTok are making, I don't know how much money a year, mocking and embarrassing and shitting on Black women by our man, it is how we talk, whatever, you know? So that to me, is allyship is what can i do so like when i work with other like uh when i work with palestinian women right because i'm very pro-palestinian i'm big on the whole middle east stuff when i work with palestinian women i don't say shit it ain't about me what i gotta say am i palestinian no all i gotta do is shut up and go okay so maybe don't do this 
in this classroom because it makes them feel this way. And when I'm around people in my family or my friends who are super Zionist or super whatever, and they're super like anti-Palestinian or whatever, maybe correct them, maybe step away, maybe don't give them access to power. I don't know, you know what I mean? Stuff like that. I think that to me is the only thing I could give as advice to people who, and that should be everybody's approach to everybody else because we all got a privilege over somebody. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, but right now, what we need to focus on in terms of the black community is how do we support, how do non-black people support black people so that they can get their shit done? One of the biggest ways to do that is get out of the way. Yeah. Number one, get out, step, step out the way. And then if you have resources that you can share, you know, don't go, don't go killing your own pockets. But I'm saying, if you have resources that you can share to support certain things to happen, that is the greater good, if anything, then please do that. Bail funds, trans travel funds, whatever. You know, it's not, it's not just packing up and going to vacation, even though they totally deserve the same access to resources to do that. But you know, that some people need that fund just to get from one abusive household to another. You know, <laughs> to get out of one. You know, so that to me is really what it is. And I, and I want to shout out punk and hardcore right now, specifically New York hardcore. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of white men in hardcore are constantly DMing me and calling me or whatever for me to unpack all of their, all of that, you know? And they want to get into bands and then they make all these really corny performative songs about stuff. So I just want to say real quick, from the bottom of my heart, everyone who's watching, stop that bullshit. Ain't nobody got time for that. Nobody got time for that. Stop, stop that, okay? <laughs> got to flick you with the tail like you're three years old. Stop that shit. Ain't nobody got time for that. And uh, don't tag me. What is wrong with you? Fucking tagging me to your dumb shit. Ain't nobody trying to hear that. So that's a blanket moratorium on Lee Floor of the Fuck Alone 2021. That's what that is. <laughs> And if you can Google it, don't ask me to explain it to you. That's yeah. it. Don't deplete my energy. Don't make it harder for me to have access to the resources that come naturally for you, but that I need to survive and step out of the way and worry about your own people. Worry about unpacking and un decolonizing your own head so that you can go and fix your people, fix yourself. Awesome. I think okay. I really only have like <laughs> one more question and that's kind of what's next for you and Mafa and what do you have going on coming up? Oh, well, we're right now working on, um, as soon as COVID permits and it's safe for everyone to do so, we're working on putting out our first full length album, hopefully at Applehead Studios, cause we love them. Shout out to Chris and Mike. And um, after that, um, depending on COVID again, some form of either live stream or whatever is safely open for touring and supporting that. We're gonna put out a lot of content this year, which is great and up the merch. And our goals are to eventually expand. And really I just, my office whole goal is to bring hardcore in a different context to places hardcore hasn't necessarily gone before, you know, and definitely not this kind of hardcore and kind of just normalize it everywhere and make sure that people understand that you can do that and it is okay and agnostic front will be just fine let leave them alone <laughs> <laughs> they'll they'll get over it and um you know um one of the tours that i want the first tour that i want to do outside of the u.s um hopefully will be to tour africa and we want to hit the punk and hardcore scene in south africa and mozambique angola and places like that they have great metal communities. They got great hardcore communities. Great bands are coming out of Africa right now. And we would like to start there. Um, I want to eventually get into things like stage plays and musical theater, you know, and put on our own stories and kind of recontextualize that so that it's not, I'm sorry, my um, step sibling, Carlos, is going to kill me for saying this, but so that it's not so corny <laughs> and enjoyable to us old farts, you know? <laughs> um, and that'll be it. And just get more into that, you know, our, uh, the booklet that the CD will come in is going to be laminated into a zine, but can also be purchased separately for educators because it'll be kind of like a little book almost, you know, yeah. with not just lyrics, but explanations and resources and so many, so much other content that eventually people can purchase that online separately as a zine 
-hmm. to use for educational purposes. So if you were to do an online Zoom class right now on the history of whatever punk and hardcore black folks and whatever, you can use that pamphlet as part of your curriculum. So it'll be set up like that. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Yes, cheers. Oh, I love your mug. <laughs> oh, wait, so, can we shout out this mug for a second? So don't be an asshole. Don't be an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> gotcha. Love it. Shout out to <laughs> mm -hmm. That's a lot. <laughs> I'm good on my questions. Kanan, did you have anything you wanted to add? Um, no, I think we covered a lot. It was really, yeah. really informative. Yeah. Thank you for being so in depth with like. Thank yeah, you. thank you so much. And um, did you want to plug your social media and all that? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you insist, you know, that's nice. Thanks, Kim. <laughs> <laughs> no, I guess my plugs are just my Instagram is afro at afro underscore morena, M O R E N A. That's my personal Instagram. And then there's Maafa Hardcore. And then on the Facebook, it's the same stuff. And that's it. Bandcamp, maafahardcore.bandcamp.com. And then just to check out the homies, support the tribe, support the Black Punk Renaissance movement that's coming out of New York right now. And it's <laughs> spread it everywhere. You know, we're everywhere, you know. So the 1865, Rebelmatic, um, Baby Got Back Talk, You Never Ignore Her, you name it, Major Taylor, we're all out here doing the thing. The Muslims, you gotta check out the Muslims out of North Carolina. Oh God, they're out of so North good. Carolina. They're so they're good. So good. <laughs> I love playing shows with them because they're, they're like, they're part of the tribe, even though they're not in New York, they're in North Carolina, but they're honorary tribe members. So we're like, that's our cousins in the South. You know, they over there in the South. You know, we all got cousins in the South. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, yeah, so the Muslims are the best. I love them. They are. They're pretty great. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for taking the time and speaking with us and being here and everything. We thank y'all so much. <laughs> I appreciate y'all so much. You're wonderful. Keep me posted and congratulations on all your success. And thank y'all so much. Nice to meet you guys. <laughs> nice to meet you. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Bye.